And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Thank you for being here tonight. And it's not as hot as I was expecting. So let's all stand and we will open our service in prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the privilege, uh, the blessing of being able to walk with you. And we thank you for the, this day set aside for us to worship you. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, the opportunity we have to sit under your word, worship you, be fed, encouraged, and give back to you. And we just pray for your blessing on every aspect of our service. Pray that you bless those that are still in their way. Use your word in our hearts. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that wrote them. We pray that the Spirit of God would take the word of God and accomplish much tonight for eternity's sake. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing. Let's check our hymnals. We'll open up to hymn 395, Standing on the Promises, hymn 395. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages. Let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, Sunday school Bible study hour begins at 9.30 Sunday morning. Today we began studying 1 Corinthians. Our next quarterly business meeting will be on Wednesday, August 10th at 7 p.m. here at the church and on Zoom. Uh, this year's men's conference hosted by Biblical Family Ministries will be on November 11th and 12th at Chad's Ford Baptist Church. This year's theme is Stewardship Responsibilities of Men. The conference begins on Friday at 1.30 p.m. And uh, this week, uh, Pat Sanina went into the ER after, 
And after a CAT scan, doctors saw that one of the cysts on her pancreas was uh, putting pressure on her kidney, creating emer an emergency situation. Uh, they can no longer wait for the pancreas to heal itself. On Monday, they will be taking out her gallbladder and doing any other necessary surgeries too, so keep her in prayer. And uh, Josh is doing well. Uh, his, basically, the ministry aspect is over. He's doing some sightseeing, and he will be heading home in three or four more days. Is that correct? Okay. So pray for, uh, for travel for Josh. And Don Watkins had a stroke last Friday. So let's uh, keep those people in prayer. This time, I'd be ushers come forward as we take our general offering. Of course, could you say a prayer for the offering, please? Now, Father, we thank you for this keeping us alive through this week, through the many turbulence and other places where Christians are persecuted. Thank you, Father, for the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We pray that as we give back to you a little bit, what you have blessed us with, that you will use it for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Garrett. The Bible says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. 
bow the knee. Have you bowed your knee to Jesus Christ? You know, that's a great challenge and a great thought, especially in light of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, there's coming a day when every knee will bow. But you and I are given the opportunity to voluntarily bow before Him now. Uh, and, the, and we've talked about that in the morning service. It is at the great white throne judgment where knees will be forced to bow that did not bow during this lifetime. I'm glad I'm not going to be a part of that. And I hope you will not either. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We are winding down. We'll be done the next two years. No, I'm kidding. We'll be done soon, actually. We really are winding down. A couple verses left. Tonight we're looking at verse 18, and there's only three more after it. Who knows how long that will take. 1 John chapter 5. When you get there, let's all stand. I mentioned today that, or tonight, we're going to focus on verse 18, but let me begin in verse 14 for our scripture reading. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 18, and then we'll remain standing in prayer. The Bible says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not pray that he shall pray for it. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. I read next time's verse, but let's bow in prayer as we stand and pray for the word. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for, we know that all scriptures give my inspiration of thee. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof. Correction and instruction and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, that you've communicated through your word. It is your word uh, that gives us knowledge of you, and I pray, Father, that you would help us to rightly interpret, rightly divide the word, so that we might clearly know the things that you've given to us. Father, what a privilege for us to be able to pray. And uh, I pray, Father, for Don Watkins, that you would lift him up. I pray for healing in his mind and his body. Uh, and as we always pray, Father, we know that you, you, you never move without purpose or plan and that you have a, a reason for even the things that happen to us. And so I pray that you'd use this in Don's life to just draw him close to yourself, draw him nearer to you. And we do pray for healing. We also pray for Pat Sanino. Uh, that you would give her peace, and as the doctors operate tomorrow, that it would be a great success, and that they would be able to um, deal with things uh, that uh, they see are issues that need to be dealt with, and that you'd lead them, make, make those things evident in, in their uh, minds, the doctors' minds, so they can tend to it. And we just lift Pat and Jim up to you and the whole family, pray that you'd bless them. And uh, Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for the people that are here tonight. And uh, thank you, Lord, that it's cooler in here. We just ask your blessing. Bless those that are online, uh, being worshiping with us. And we ask you for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll turn to hymn 680, Rejoice in the Lord, hymn 680. <laughs> never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and molding a man give thanks to the Lord though your testing seems long in darkness he giveth Song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, He makes no mistake, He knoweth the end of each path that I take.
through the shadows ahead. So I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day. Then peace came and tears fled Again, thank you for coming tonight. With this weather, I know that not very popular in America. It's not any popular anymore to come to church Sunday night. So uh, I am grateful for every one of you being here tonight. Let's take our Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And tonight we're going to look at verse 18. Uh, I had originally planned to include it with our message last week. Uh, verses 16 and 17. The sin unto death. And what is that? And of course we addressed that last week. Um, but I, I did that because I was going to include verse 18 because I want you to realize that it is same, part of the same text. So John is talking about uh, prayer. Remember that? That's why we read that whole beginning of verse 14 tonight. Confidence in prayer. But then he challenges us. If any, if any, brother see, if any man see a brother sin not unto death, that we are challenged to pray for them. And then he mentioned the sin that is unto death. Uh, and of course, I'm not going to go into that. But keeping in, in that in mind, that we are talking about sin in a believer's life. And then John states in verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. It's not the first time he's made that statement in this book. And we're going to look at that. What is that? Whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God. And that again, this is not the first time he's talked about being begotten of God. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. That last statement is what I want you to connect to what John was saying in last week's message about the sin unto death. Uh, and we realize that sin is serious. Sin affects God's people. And uh, it can cause, it can, if sin that is not dealt with could cause God to call someone home. But keep in mind the context, he's writing to believers. And... Uh, you and I, that wicked one toucheth him not. What a blessing. We'll look at that at the end of our message today. But let's, let's pray for God's blessing before we jump in and interpret, uh, expound the scriptures. And uh, just thank you again for being here tonight. Father, help me, help us 
as we look at this idea of being born of God and uh, Satan's inability to touch us. And we ask your, your blessing tonight. Encourage the flock. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your provisions for us, for the Christian walk, for our sanctification. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the finished work of Jesus Christ and how uh, we have the ability, we have the privilege of walking with you and fellowship with you because of what Christ has accomplished. And so we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So tonight we want to look at, in fact, um, he mentions earlier in, in our text in this passage, the idea of victory. And that's what he's really talking about tonight. Victory, uh, in verse 18, we're just going to break this down into the three parts of the, this verse. Uh, we're going to see victory over the power of sin. Uh, let, uh, again, verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Victory over the power of sin. And then the second part, victory over the power of destruction. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Uh, how God keeps us, and then the last part is victory over the power of Satan. And again, that's uh, the wicked. That wicked one toucheth him not. So let's go back now to verse eighteen, the beginning of the verse. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Again, this is not a new concept. Um, we want to first look at this idea, though, because he's talking about being born of God, being born of God. In chapter 4 and verse 7, he talked about being born of God. He said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And then in 1 John chapter 5, the text, the chapter we're in, verse 1, he begins, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So the idea of being born of God is a very important and, and oft-mentioned theme. In verse 4 of 1 John chapter 5, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And that... Uh, leads us to really verse 18 too, because we're talking about victory. Victory that is only possible because of Jesus Christ. So the idea of being born of, God, born of God, what is that? And then let's bring this other statement in that's mentioned a lot. And it's also found in verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Now being born of God, and being begotten of God come from the same root word. Uh, one, the being born of God is a perfect participle, and then the second one is an aorist participle. They're basically parts of the same word. Being birthed is the idea. They're not talking about two separate things. Listen to some of these other verses that we've already looked at from John that use the idea of being begotten. Ver uh, chapter 5, verse 1, I already read this, but... Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's why I quoted it first. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him, birthed of him. First uh, John 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat... Or I just read that. Uh, some other verses. In fact, let's back up, because the idea of being begotten simply means that. It means to be birthed. And it can be used in a generic sense. For example, Peter used it. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. If you are born of God, you have been begotten of God. What we are talking about is regeneration. Have you heard of that phrase? It's what Jesus was talking about to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when he made those very important words to Nicodemus, a religious man. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 7 he said, you must be born again. And then Peter mentions that idea of being born again. It is just another way of expressing regeneration. In other words, Giving life. 
Are you born again tonight? You know, that is kind of an unusual phrase that is not embraced by many. And I remember when I first heard the gospel as a teenager, uh, it was a term that I had not heard growing up. And yet it was bandied about much by the, the people that were witnessing to me. And it made me realize this is an important word. And of course, I went back to my religious leaders and, and talked to them about it. And, you know, they gave me their take on it. But their take on it didn't emphasize the importance that Jesus put on it. Think of what he said. Unless except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I mean, how clear is that? Very important. Saying if you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. That's why in verse 7 he said you must be born again. So the same scriptures that challenge us to be born again, born of God, also tell us how to be born of God. And um, it's important that we, we look at that. So, look at verse 18 again. 1 John five eighteen. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And, in fact, let's look at that idea, the idea of sinning not. Because we've really already dealt with it. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9 is where we um, really dealt with it. Remember this verse, 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now you remember during that time, um, the way this is worded does not really, it, it's not part of our common language. It, it's, it's a peculiar statement. Take it at face value, and what does it seem to be saying? It seems to be saying something that I've never heard a Christian struggle with, and I've mentioned this during that sermon, I've never had a Christian come up to me and say, Pastor, you know, I see everybody else sinning, and, and I really want to, because it's kind of like the thing to do, but I just cannot sin. Right? Because that's what it says, right? Again, his seed remaineth him, and he cannot sin. I've never ever met a Christian who struggled because they just couldn't sin no matter how hard they tried. Then why is he saying that? Why does he say, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin? And by the way, some people use this text and 1 John 3, 9 to teach sinless perfection. This side of heaven. That the Christian who gets saved can reach a point of sinless perfection. Now, I'm not going to address that tonight because we looked at that when we looked at 1 John 3, 9. Um, and folks, very clearly, what does the Bible say? Remember what Paul said, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. That's more the struggle I can experience and, and that's the vibes I get from Christians. They're not coming to me saying... Pastor, please help me sin. I just, I just can't. And I want, to sh I want to prove I'm human. No, it's the other way around. Pastor, I'm struggling with sin. So we're not, this is not talking about sinless perfection. This is not saying, folks, that on this side of glory, you will and you can attain sinless perfection. The idea of this sinning not is clearly talking about a habitual, continual um, living in sin without any problem. Like, you know, just I'm continuing in sin. And, and Paul, or excuse me, John already in the first chapter very, laid it out very clearly. He that says he has no sin is a liar and deceives himself. Right? It's just the opposite. The person who is born of God is very conscious of the sin struggle. And that's the very thing that makes it a battle. Uh, you know, when somebody is not saved, they don't struggle with sin. I mean, they don't. They don't mind cursing. They don't mind living in sin and, and embracing the way of the world. They're not struggling with it. They've embraced it. 
There's no conviction because the Spirit of God isn't within them. And then in, in, I mentioned 1 John 3, 9, but a few verses before that also talks about not sinning. 1 John 3, 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And remember, keep, that, keep in mind, to put that in context, we're talking about does not live in habitual, continuous, unrepentant sin. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Many years ago, in fact, this still goes on today, where you know atheists have meetings Atheists have groups, you know, that, that they, national groups, where they, they gather together under the banner of not believing something, God. And they get together regularly, and they have conventions. National Atheist Association. Can you imagine that? I mean, that'd be like um, the National Unicorn Society. No, the, the Non-Unicorn Society. We do not believe in unicorns. And we are so passionate about it that we're going to meet every day or, or at least, you know, a couple times or once a year. We're going to meet and we're going to talk about how the fact that we don't believe in unicorns. If you don't believe there's a God, what a nonsensical group to have. Of course, there, there's some real animosity there towards us and Christians. And so during one of these meetings, they had speakers and... Um, one of the men took a sub, this subject of the creation of man. And with contempt and scorn, he got up to the pulpit, the microphone, I don't, I don't know, I guess they don't call them pulpits, I don't know. And he said this, What man with any common sense could believe that several thousand years ago, God stooped down, picked up a piece of mud in his hand, and breathing on it, changed it into a man? Absurd, came the cry from his associates. A Christian was in the audience. And he heard that. And he stood up. And he said, you might ask me many questions about the creation of man, which I could not answer. He said, but there is one thing I know. God stooped down one night and picked up the dirtiest piece of mud in town, and he breathed upon it by his spirit, and from that very moment it was newly created. Changed from a gambling, drinking, thieving wretch into a man of God. For 23 years, that changed bit of mud has never gambled, drunk, or thieved. I was that bit of mud. It's easy to raise cheap sneers at the Bible, but it is not so easy to answer such a changed life as mine. I love that. You know, the power of God. And people will mock it. And that's what James is communicating when he says he doesn't sin. Now this guy is testifying. He's saying, you know what? I used to be, as he says, a gambling, drunken, thieving wretch. He's not claiming perfection. He's not saying, I no longer sin. But the sins that ensnared him, of particularly gambling, drinking, and thieving, are not part of his life anymore because of the power of the gospel. Because he is born of God. And by the way, I want to remind you that there are some sins that Christians are easily able to shed. I still, to this day, Bob Brennan was one of our precious missionaries that's been with the Lord for a long time. And he made a big impact on my life. He was a missionary to the Jew, uh, Jews. And he did a fantastic job of equipping God's people to evangelize the Jews. And uh, he was apparently a rough and tumbler brawler before he got saved. And he had apparently had a foul mouth. And I still remember to this day, every time he'd give his testimony, and he'd say, he'd talk about how he, you know, every other word was an expletive before he got saved. And then he'd say in his Bob Brennan voice, I'm not, I'm not even going to try it, but he'd say, you know how many times I've cursed since then? And then he'd do this. Whoa, I remember that. We're all like, whoa, none, you don't curse once? Now that doesn't mean that people in the congregation who sat under that, I could just imagine someone like, oh man, I'm a loser because I still struggle with profanity. Not to, you know, keep in mind, folks, there are some, some sins that God's people are able to conquer and move on and some they battle with. But that's the key. They battle with. 
But when you're born of God, and that's the idea, and as this man testifies, it's the power of God in you, working out of you, that transforms your life. That is the sanctification process. So victory over the power of sin. And by the way, remember, when you got saved, you were delivered from the penalty of sin. So you, there's no condemnation now to them which are in Christ Jesus. But there's three parts of our salvation. What happened the day we got saved, and then the ongoing sanctification process, which is being delivered from the power of sin. It began the day you got saved, and he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's what God is doing in you, conforming you to the image of his Son. And then the third, final aspect is when we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. Glory, hallelujah. Can't wait for that. But look at verse 18 now. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Now there's some challenges with the wording of this and there's uh, various different takes on it because it's somewhat general. But the idea clearly is talking about God's Keeping power in our lives. That happens when we are born again. By the way, that phrase, born again, even in the King James translation, in, in two, the two references in John, in the marginal notes it says, where it says born again, it says, or born from above. That's what regeneration is. It's being born from above. And Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 1.23, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So are you born again? I want to talk about that. I have shared this statistic several times, uh, and it's getting to be an older statistic, but it's still, uh, though I'm sure it's changed because America is getting less religious, uh, it's still pretty accurate, I believe, uh, by a Christian research group. And um, they, they questioned America and wanted to get the feel or the pulse of, prof of people that they would label born-again Christians. Let me read to you, the um, first of all, how they identified who was going to fit the category of being a born-again Christian. And in their releases, they say, born-again Christians were not defined in our study on the basis of characterizing themselves as being born again. In other words, they didn't say, okay, who calls, who's born again? All right, we got some questions for you. They didn't do that. But it was based upon their answers to two questions. The first question, pay attention to this. The first question was, have you ever made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that is still important in your life today? Pretty general question, but those of you that have been born again, how would you answer that? Yeah, sure. So, if for those Americans that answered yes on that, then they were given seven different questions to pinpoint whether they'd fall under the category of born again. And a lot of those questions just whittled away, you know, how do you think you were born again? And, you know, clearly some of the, th the things that would not be scriptural help to identify it. But one of the seven perspectives was this. When I die, I will go to heaven because I have confessed my sins and have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. So if you answered yes to the first one, and if you answered yes to the second one, you were put in the category of being born again. Now, those of us that are born again here, if you knew the other six questions, I'm not going to go in that direction, but we probably would have fallen into that category. But, listen to the results of this now. Of those that fit into this category of born-again Christians, about 26% believe that it doesn't matter what faith you follow because they all teach the same lesson. Really? 31% of, they called them born-agains, agree that while Jesus lived on this earth, he committed sins like other people. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking these guys are moving less and less to being born again the Bible way. 
15% of born-again Christians in this category claim that after he was crucified and died, Jesus did not return to life physically. Huh? And then there's another one here. Half of the born-again Christians, 50% of the people that fell into this category. By the way, let's, let me just stop right here. The more and more I looked at this study and, and I thought, how could people that are born again answer these questions this way? Remember what we're talking about in our Bible study hour about quick prayerism and, and the need for repentance? There's nothing in that survey that talks about how these people, if they dealt with sin, how they dealt with sin. There's no preaching against sin, no repentance. Ah, now I'm starting to get to understand. So 50% of the, these professing born-again Christians agree that Satan is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil. Really? I remember at prison, when we did the prison ministry years ago, I had an inmate that came up to me, and he was, he was a, a new believer. And uh, In fact, he even visited the church a time or two after he got out. But I remember him telling me, how much the Bible has become so important in his life. And he was really excited about the things of the Lord. And then he said, he said, but I also want you to know, he said, I do not believe. Uh, I do not believe in the devil and I don't believe in hell. But then he looked at me for approval like, is, is that okay? <laughs> and I, I, I took it as, okay, here's a, a new young believer and... I don't think he was throwing his talent and saying, I believe this. He was, he's like saying it, and then he wasn't so sure that was right. So there might be some teachable moments there. But folks, if you're going to believe the Bible about being born again, you better be able to believe the Bible about the resurrection. In fact, you can't be born again without a resurrection. And you better believe the Bible when it talks about hell and Satan, because that's what Jesus saved us from. So it's an amazing thing to me. By the way, according to their study, that broad category, this was again over 50, about 15 years ago, there were about 80 to 85 million professing born-again Christians in America, according to that category. 80 to 85 million. Now, last time the, the uh, surveys were done, the, the census two years ago, there were 329.5 million people. 329.5 million people in America 80 to 85 percent are born again. I don't know about that. Not the Bible way, as I understand it. There's an old uh, devotional magazine that was printed in London called the London City Mission Magazine. Came out in the turn of the 19th, the 20th century, 1900s, and it shared the lady shared the testimony of a lady who lived in Croydon. She lived in a one-room cottage, and she was visited by a missionary. When she was a hundred years old, and she was presented the gospel. And when, after she heard the gospel and responded, her first statement was, How wonderful and how good the Lord has been in sparing me these hundred years that I might learn the way of life. Think about it. A hundred years old. And she got said, so what if she died at the age of 99? Even 89. I mean, that's just amazing. And the end of the article, it said this. Born 1825, born again 1925. Wow, that's, the, that's awesome. Now, everyone here has a born date. I know some of the librarians aren't exactly sure which date theirs is, but you all, we all have... And even if you don't know exactly what year you were born, you know that you were born a particular year, right? <laughs> right? And, and Gord, Gord's shaking his head, giving affirmation, yes. But I want to ask you something. Do you have a born-again date? The Bible way, the way Jesus talked about. I mentioned to you that growing up, that was not a phrase that we used. Um, and when I was presented with the gospel... Uh, I understood the significance of that term, and that was one of the clearest ways in witnessing, and to this day, uh, to get people thinking about spiritual things 
and something they, that even the religious might not be accustomed to, is asking them, have you been born again? And again, it was, it's strange language to those who may be religious, but not preaching the need to be born again uh, the Bible way. So I remember um, for, for many years living at home, I was the only born again in my family and my distant family, my cousins, my relatives. Uh, I, there's a chance that I believe my grandfather might have been born again. And uh, in fact, he would encourage me as a young preacher and in Bible school. Uh, and, but I, I was basically the wayward son. And I felt bad. I, I did not intend to be a disappointment to my family. Um, you know, I've, I've, since I've been a pastor, I've ministered to many moms that would have been thrilled if their, their sons became pastors. Um, you know, it wasn't so easy for my parents to this day. Uh, but, I, but I was always viewed as the wayward son, you know. And then years ago, one of my relatives started, on my, um, my father's side of the family, my, um, my dad's dad, which was my grandfather, died two, about two weeks before my dad's fourth birthday. So my dad really did not know his dad. And I definitely did not know. I wasn't even born but on my grandmother's side of the family, there was, you know, and like, you know, we didn't, it was always a mystery. There was some, all families have this. So we don't talk about that side of the family. Don't, you know, you know, you ever have that, you know, we don't talk about that. So it was always a mystery and always wonder, but I just, in some ways, I just felt like I'm the big loser because I was, you know, I was left the faith and became a Baptist pastor. It's like the exact opposite of what I grew up on. And, and one of my relatives, and, and many of you know this story, but I want to tell you, I will never get over this. This is so special to me. Uh, a discovery that was made well into my Christian life. A relative uh, traveled the world, traveled America, and especially went down to Kentucky and found records of my great-grandfather. So that would have been my grandfather that died when my dad was three. His dad, my great-grandfather. And the most amazing thing, I think my cousin is the one that actually was able to get a copy of the church records about my great-grandfather, William Whitney Lyon. And it was from the Glasgow Junction Baptist Church. It was... The records, the, the ri handwritten minutes of the church from 1917. Ju uh, Glasgow Junction Missionary Baptist Church. And it said this in their records, in their minutes. On June 6, 1917, God in His infinite wisdom saw fit to call from our midst our beloved brother William Whitney Lyon after a long illness of many months which he bore with Christian patience and fortitude and the cheerful demeanor and noble spirit which characterized his life at all times. Oh, man. I want to know more about that sentence. You know, oh, it sounds like a great guy. Now I know it's only a sentence and you can read into it, but think about this. This was, this was what marked his... This went down in history. It's, it's something that connects me. I can know a little bit about my great-grandfather. After a long illness of many months, which he bore with Christian patience and fortitude, and the cheerful demeanor and noble spirit, which characterized his life at all times. Wow, what a blessing. Sounds like he was a good testimony, but then, music to my ears is what comes after. He was born, and by the way, there's a, uh, th this differs in what's on his gravestone by a little difference, but that was common back then. He was born October 15th, 1850. He was born again in 1865. I love that. I love He was a teen, and he heard the gospel. And so he was a deacon at Glasgow Junction Missionary Baptist Church that apparently had a great testimony, and he was born again. And so all of a sudden now, I'm not necessarily the wayward child. 
I'm going back to our roots. Now, nobody, you know, my family, I don't think, appreciates that like I do. But what a blessing. Someday I'm going to get to go, you know, I'm going to get to meet William Whitney Lyon. Grandpa, great-grandpa. Oh, i got some questions for you. Uh, you know, first of all, I want to hear about how he got saved and all. He's born again. He's born of God. What a blessing. What an incredible blessing. And folks, it is important that you be born again the Bible way. Because unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And now we close with this last statement in verse 18, the third part. And that wicked one toucheth him not. Now we've already read in 1 John 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's the devil, is it not? But think of this verse. This is a promise. That wicked one, referring to Satan, toucheth him not. I'm reminded of the statement that Jesus made in John chapter 10. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 10. He said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. You know, that, I've always just looked at that just as the promise that it is, that no one's going to pluck you out of the Father's hand. You know, when God saves us, folks, He preserves us. Nobody's going to take you out. But the more I study this text in John, I realize that it's almost like He's saying that there's going to be someone, i.e. that wicked one, in verse 18, that is going to try to pluck you out of the Father's hand. In fact, that's why Jesus would mention it. No man's going to pluck you out of my hand, and then my Father's greater than me. No man's going to pluck you out of my Father's hand. I think the, the wicked one that's referred to in verse 18 may be the very one that Jesus was talking about, that Satan may very well be trying to pluck us out of the Father's hand, those of us that are saved. But... What a blessed thought. That wicked one toucheth him not. I close with this statement a couple, uh, some, within the last few years, and I am really bad on time. There was a shooting in a synagogue in Pittsburgh. Anybody remember about when that happened? Am I right that it was within the last couple of years? Within the last year? Longer than that. Two years ago? Maybe? Okay, about two years. Everything I say in my mind, every, every part of my life's history was two years ago. And my family will tell you, Dad, this was not two years ago. So for this actually to be two years ago is quite, I'm kind of encouraged. Yes, Garrett, what year? Four years ago, okay. Scratch that idea, <laughs> all right. Anyway, so when that shooting happened, uh, Brother Craig Hartman, I love that guy, uh, in his prayer letter uh, was, was talking about those events and how they unfold and what's happening and how, um, you know, the world hates the Jews and, and so forth. And in his last, the last part of his letter, he gave a couple quick exhortations. I wrote down a couple, but I just want to read you the one. He was challenging the church in light of this animosity towards, towards the Jews. He said, the devil is active in this age. Get that? We must never let our guard down while he is seeking to devour and destroy. We are no match for him, but can only withstand him if we rely on Jesus to strengthen and protect us. Further, the devil hates what God loves, so he hates Israel. He will never cease to try to destroy her until Messiah sends him to his future eternal abode in the lake of fire. How true that is. But what a blessing, folks that that wicked one, we have the promise, will not touch the child of God. And not that he's not going to harass us, not that he's not going to try to torment us, but folks, remember, when you and I are in the Father's hand, no one plucks us out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, help us 
as we grasp these simple, simple truths, that the glorious light of the gospel of Christ would shine in unto us, that uh, folks would be saved as you illuminate their eyes, uh, that they would experience the new birth, regeneration. By faith, we're so grateful that you give unto us eternal life and we will never perish. Father, thank you for uh, the, the privilege of the fact that we are born of God, born of you. Help us, Father, to live in light of that and to bring glory to your name. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's all stand, take out your hymn books, and we will close in song. All right, let's turn to hymn 603 in the sweet by and by, hymn 603. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet. Not a sigh for the blessings of rest In the sweet by and by We shall sing on a beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore To our bountiful Father Blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet.